Well, Qatar blockaded by the Saudis, Egypt and others on charges of backing terrorism is now fighting back. Qatar has now opened its books for audit by international agencies and it stresses that it has billions of dollars in reserves. It is now also opening bids to expand its gas production. Here's a report. Qatar's rulers were making some telling points ahead of the U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson's visit. The head of the central bank said they had $40 billion in cash and gold. The Qatar Investment Authority had another $300 billion in reserves. He said, and I quote, This is the credibility of our system. We have enough cash to preserve any, any kind of shock. So we don't believe that there is anything to worry about at this moment. What I can say is that our environment is proof to anybody that we are, first of all, solid, strong and resilient against any kind of shocks." Unquote. Qatar has offered to open its books as proof that its economy is not going under. While there have been outflows traced to non-residents and ratings agency Moody's has downgraded Qatar's sovereign status from stable to negative, the Qataris claim that inflows have exceeded outflows, that financially the country remains solid. Qatar has also stepped up its own campaign against Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt that have led the blockade against Qatar ostensibly for its support of terrorism. It is setting up a committee to pursue multi-billion dollar compensation claims against these countries with support from the International Criminal Court which has expressed regret over the blockade on Qatar. More support from international oil majors Exxon, Mobil, Shell and Total that are pushing the US and the French governments to allow them to bid for the proposed expansion of Qatar's gas production from the current 77 million tons of natural gas to 100 million tons by 2024. If Qatar plays its cards right, the blockade may well collapse on its own. Bureau Report, we on. Well, joining us now on our South Asia Focus discussion is former ambassador to Jordan, Libya and Malta, Anil Trigunayat from New Delhi. We also have retired Commodore Uday Bhaskar also joining us from New Delhi. Thank you both for joining us. Let me first ask the question to Anil. Is Qatar as confident as the world wants it to believe and how really has it fared over the last one month? Anil? Well, so far, I think that Qatar has fared both economically as well as diplomatically. Uh, diplomatically, they have shown tremendous maturity uh, compared to what has been shown by the countries that are blockading it. It has not been uh, at all uh, very difficult for them to wait through this so far. How long they will continue with this? Definitely it had had an impact on the economy somewhat, but not to the extent that it will deter them or bring them down to accept the unreasonable demands that the four countries had tried to impose on Qatar. And I believe that, and uh, I've just, uh, just come today here, and I find that there is a tremendous amount of patriotism. There is a great feeling about the country itself. And uh, people are, things are going as usual. I mean, of course, the, the things have changed, the shade of things have changed here. But at the same time, I find that Qatar has been holding on very well, and I doubt that it will go under any pressure. Of course, the, uh, the British, uh, Foreign Secretary was here a day ago, and uh, today uh, Tillerson is, uh, Secretary of State Tillerson is in uh, Kuwait. Right. He will be coming to Qatar, I guess, tomorrow. And therefore, they are all trying very hard, and everybody has to find a way where there is some kind of a face saving. Um, because both of them, uh, especially the, the Saudis and the Qataris and the Emiratis, have really climbed a very high tree. It's a very difficult for them to come down to this level. And that is why everybody is trying to find a way how to do the face saving. In addition, as you know, that recently in the UK, there was this report that has been published and which clearly um, vindicates the stand of many other countries that Saudi Arabia itself has been involved in some financing Wahhabi uh, philosophies all across the world. And therefore, they are also on the back foot at the moment. All right, let's now bring into the conversation Uday Bhaskar, Director of Policy Studies as well. Uday, thank you so much for joining us. Do we think the other states, perhaps in the Middle East or West Asia, perhaps uh, overestimated their ability to hold Qatar to ransom? I mean, Qatar certainly seems like it's brushing it off and at least putting on a brave front. Uday? Yeah, 
I think that's a fair way of characterizing the assessment made by Saudi and its own support team. I think they overestimated their ability and perhaps underestimated Qatar's own resilience to deal with the kind of challenge that was posed. But my own reading, if I may add, is that Qatar is, I think, dealing with this in a very prudent and perhaps innovative manner. We already have been given a sense about what kind of fiscal depth they have in dealing with the challenge. And of course, Qatar's own, I would say, status as far as being a major hydrocarbon supplier is concerned, particularly in gas, is something that the global community recognizes. But I was very struck by the way in which their public prosecutor, Mr. Ali Almari, had actually, I think, introduced a new dimension wherein he's taking recourse to legal options. And I think this is a challenge to our current understanding of globalization because he has tried to frame it in such a way saying that this unreasonable kind of demand and related strictures that had been placed on Qatar have led to a number of businesses and individuals suffering a certain loss and that this was invalid and it was unreasonable. And therefore, Qatar is going to encourage its own affected partners and people to take right. legal recourse. So I think this is going to pose a challenge for the entire region. And for Saudi, a last point I want to make, it's almost like saying that they have opened two fronts. You have Qatar and you have what is going on in Yemen. So I think there is a case of overestimating what they could do. All right, let's also uh, get some perspective on the latest developments happening in Qatar. In fact, Qatar has about $340 billion in reserves that could help the country to weather the isolation by its powerful Arab neighbors. The central bank governor says it has about $40 billion in reserves plus gold, while the Qatar Investment Authority Wealth Fund says it has another $300 billion stocked up in reserves. Now, stocks in Qatar have also weakened. The rial there has also been volatile, especially after Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt cut diplomatic and transportation ties a month back on June the 5th exactly. Those countries accused Qatar of supporting terrorism. Doha, on the other hand, has denied all of these allegations. So that's sort of the dynamics playing out in the Middle East or West Asia, as we like to call it. Well, defined in the face of extreme pressure from its uh, Gulf peers, the central bank says they do have this amount of money. So are they just putting on a brave front? Is this just perhaps, uh, uh, you know, a, a way for them to look stronger than they actually actually are. All of this, of course, uh, coming in the midst of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, supporting Qatar, perhaps for its own benefits. Uh, what also is interesting is uh, the demands, including the closure of Al Jazeera, one of the prominent channels there in Qatar. Now, the GCC countries all blame Al Jazeera of allegedly working to destabilize the region. Reports say the channel had long angered Arab governments for presenting alternative views since its inception. Now, meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is expected to be in Kuwait to help seek a resolution to the Gulf crisis. Reports say that Tillerson will meet with senior Kuwait officials to talk about the ongoing issue there as the diplomatic ties with Qatar are all cut by its neighbors. All right, let's get our discussion going really quickly. I want to bring Anil back in. Anil, what about the U.S. and all of this? You know, uh, how is the U.S. perhaps uh, strategically playing its cards when it comes to Qatar? Are they playing the diplomatic game well, uh, sort of trying to please both sides? Well, you know that the U.S. Uh, is probably the only country at the moment which holds uh, the control or some kind of a say on both Saudi Arabia as well as Qatar, as well as the Emirates and the Egyptians. And they are the only ones who could probably try to. Had it not been for the mixed signals coming in the beginning from uh, President Trump and his State Department, as well as the Pentagon, I think the situation could not have become like this. It was exactly the kind of a repeat uh, of the Iraqi war. As you know, Iraq uh, was given to understand that they could go ahead and invade Kuwait by the Americans. So there were the mixed signals. And exactly, it is that kind of a repeat that seemed to be happening. But then, compared to these big countries, what the Qataris did was played a very matured diplomacy. They did not throw out any of the, uh, the, the citizens of these countries from them. They were allowed to operate, they were allowed to continue, and they continued to reach out to the international community in a legal manner, as you have also mentioned. And previous speaker, the Vaskar, also said the same thing. 
So the legal ease, they are going, they went to the UN, they have gone to the human rights, they have right. gone to the ICAO. So they are trying to go it at the legal way. At the same time, they are bracing for the worst. And that is a fact here because you do not know if the regime change here as well is the agenda of these countries. Uh, then uh, I think that it is important that the international community, especially the U.S., must intervene effectively, which they are going to do. And I think that they are trying to find some way. As you know, one of the demands was to severe ties with Iran completely. Now, what one understands, although it has not been made public, apparently Qatar said that all the other countries uh, in the GCC should also do the same. So they were asking the same kind of a parity on equal treatment. Right. But that is not that is denied. So these are the kind of the demands were extremely unreasonable. Everybody knows that they were they cannot be met and they cannot be agreed to. Although I know that as far as Muslim Brotherhood and some other leaders are concerned, the way Qatar might give in to that to some extent. All right. But Let me bring uh, Oday back in really quickly. Oday, uh, as we sort of wrap things up, while America, backed by the Saudis, wants to target Iran for allegedly uh, fomenting terrorism, Tehran is aiding Doha. It also has the isolation of uh, Qatar. Now, has this widened uh, among some of the other Gulf states? Uh, your thoughts? My thoughts really are that while the United States may have very strong views on Iran, I think the way they approached the Qatar issue was feckless. And I use this word very advisedly. Because you can see that the history of the United States in terms of its interventions, whether it was in Iraq or in Syria, or the tacit support in Libya, has not had a very happy ending. And I think the manner in which the Trump team reached out, supported the so-called Saudi initiative, right. has led to the current impasse. And I hope there would be a review of what is going on. All right. And really quickly, as we wrap this up, I want to ask this question to both of you. Why is Qatar, a tiny country in West Asia, so important in the global scheme of things? Is it possible for the Western powers, let alone Arab nations, to really cut it off? And I mean, even if they do, what are the implications? As we've just seen Qatar sort of brushing it off and saying, you know, we don't really we don't really care. We can stand on our own two feet. I'll first start with Anil and then we'll go to Uday next. Anil? Yeah. No, in fact, as you know, the Qatar is extremely, uh, they are very, very rich in terms of their gas reserves, and uh, which is now going to be capitalized, and the major uh, operators in the world are already interested in it. So from that point of view, it is very important. Secondly, for the Americans, they have a base here. They are based and they are fighting the terrorism or ISIS they have been fighting, which is on its last legs, apparently, and uh, even in Syria. I mean, therefore, from their strategic perspective, Qatar is extremely important. And Qatar hosted the Americans at the time when they were asked to leave the Saudis from their base. So therefore, they consider it to be an important thing. And I think that they were amiss uh, in uh, following the path they did during the visit of Trump or the Trump's own uh, statements were somewhat premature in my view. And therefore, they have caused this kind of um, an unnecessary uh, the, the problem in the GCC. And I hope that GCC countries realize that they continue to remain so. In my view, it is going to be very difficult for the Qataris to forget the kind of humiliation they have gone through. All right. And last but not least, Uday Bhaskar, let me get your thoughts on this. You know, uh, how important is Qatar? then they really seem to make it out. Are they as important a small country in West Asia or the Middle East uh, uh, really making big moves, uh, sort of ignoring uh, the brushes by its neighbors? Oh, but well, I would say that despite the fact that they are a relatively small country, I think they managed to acquire a profile which was quite visible. Qatar has also made certain moves on the regional chessboard, which I think were not very prudent. But at the end of the day, I think Qatar has shown that it has both if I could use that word, right. a certain degree of spine. And they were also willing to stand up and be counted and say their piece. And Al Jazeera, I think, is a very good example of the kind of reach that Qatar had managed to establish for itself. And clearly, this was not to the liking of the other players. So I think all of this contributed to the current kind of situation, which I still believe could have been handled differently, both by Washington Saudi Arabia and the other GCC members who have reached out to support the Saudi initiative. So in, you know, in terms of what TV can do, I'm still making this plea for all the principal players to really review right. where they are and pull back in the most appropriate manner. All right. And as we like to do at the end of our discussion, three final words from both of our guests, Anil and Uday, three final words to wrap up this discussion, our South Asia focus. Anil, three final words. I hope uh, that they will be able to come to the dialogue table and resolve it.
All right, uh, Uday, three final words. Three final words, please review carefully. Please review carefully. All right, thank you both for your perspective on our South Asia focus as it pertains to Qatar, Anil Trugunayat, and Uday Bhaskar.